Thanks very much. Uh, um, that if one could understand all the chemical processes on, uh, ongoing within a burning candle, one would be able to understand the entire universe. Although maybe on a less universal scale, I would still claim that if one understands the biological processes undergoing Arabidopsis fruit development, one will not only understand about the fundamental aspects of development of our multicellular organisms, but also be able to use all of this knowledge to improve crop yield. And for instance, some of the projects that we have undergoing in the lab is to understand how uh, tissue polarity is formed during organogenesis, how organs communicate between each other, and also using mathematical modeling, be able to predict distribution of, of hormones during organ development and how this affects organ patterning. We also have projects that are aiming at understanding how growth um, in, in various dimensions is part of, uh, of uh, establishing the shape of different organs. And we believe that understanding all these processes will then help us to address issues, especially in the very uh, 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 close uh, um, related Arabidopsis, uh, closely related to Arabidopsis crop in oil seed rape. And one of the examples that we have been focused on initially in this translational, also translational efforts is to address the issue of pot shatter in oil seed rape. And pot shatter is a process in which the seed pot opens and disperse the seeds. And this is a process that is in, in, extremely important for uh, plants growing in nature, of course, to disperse the seeds very effectively. But it's a very undesirable trait for, uh, for crops. And in particular, farmers of oilseed rape in the UK lose on average 15% of their yield every year due to pot shatter. That equates to about 160 million pounds every year. So we now have a, a, a project where we have used some of the fundamental knowledge we have obtained in Arabidopsis about fruit, uh, fruit development and seed dispersal. And then we have obtained a grant from uh, the uh, BBSRC Crop Improvement Club to uh, translate this directly into oil seed rape. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our efforts in this area. So you can see here, in, in morphological terms, how closely related Arabidopsis and Brassicas, which includes oil seed rape, they are. Uh, these are the, are the fruits, and they are both composed of of two valves or seed pot walls, um, a replum that runs in the center of the fruit, and at the border between the replum and the uh, valves, there are these very specialized cells called valve margin cells developing. And it's at this valve margin that a dehiscence zone will develop late in development to allow the valves to separate from the replum and release the seeds in this process that we call uh, pot shatter. So a lot of the factors, the genetic factors involved in setting up the Arabidopsis fruit are already known and mainly based on work in Marianovsky's lab at UC San Diego. So we know now, for instance, that there are these valve margin identity factors, shatterproof and indehiscent, or ship and indi for short, that are, are responsible for identifying the valve margin cells. But the activity of these genes are restricted from both sides, the valve sides by a gene called fruitful and replum side from, from, by a gene called replumless, to really restrict the activities to the valve margin cells. So we thought that we, perhaps we could use this scheme to address pot shatter in, in brassicas. And the first attempt that we did was to overexpress the fruitful gene with the idea that we would then everywhere repress valve margin identity. And when we did this in brassica, what we found was this. Here we have a wild type brassica fruit that opens along the valve margins. And here we have a, a, a fruit that overexpresses the fruitful gene. And as you can see, these fruits here are completely indehiscent compared to wild type. So although this is an important lesson that we can translate fundamental knowledge from the model system into, crop, into crops, it's not a very desirable outcome for the farmer because he would actually have to manually break open each pot in the field to get the seeds out. So it's clear that this is a trait that will have to be fine-tuned in order to get the, uh, the proper effect. So we, we set up a different approach using our brassica rapa uh, tilling population, brassica rubber is a diploid brassica, so the genetics is a little bit simpler in this, in, compared to the uh, polyploid brassica mapus. And when we then tilled in one of these uh, valve margin identity genes directly, and this gene was called indehiscence, indehiscence, we then obtain uh, this over here. This is the mutant, this is wild type over here. And you can see 
uh, compared to uh, uh, the transgenic approach that we took up here, we haven't really got very much further because also these fruits, by completely knocking out the activity of this gene, we also get a completely loss of valve Martin identity. But the advantage of tilling is that you can get an allelic series with point mutations in the gene that only will slightly, or, or a bit stronger perhaps, uh, modify the, uh, the effect. So in this case here, we have lines that are only, uh, have only partially lost the valve Martin identity. And these lines, we can then go in and find the one that has the optimal level of shattering that is required. So now we are taking, uh, the, we're having this sort of uh, encouraging result. We are now uh, using the uh, CERC uh, uh, project to then translate this knowledge directly into elite varieties of oilseed rape. But shattering is a very uh, plastic trait that is affected by many environmental factors as well. So in the, in the last couple of years, we have identified some other components that are involved in regulating valve market. And this is particularly components that are relating uh, genetic and uh, hormonal interactions. And by using some of this knowledge here, we have also managed to now um, obtain mutants that uh, change the hormonal distribution in during brassica development and then lead to uh, control of, uh, of shattering. So we are trying to also use other attempts to address and, and really pack the brassica fruit with more seeds and therefore increase yield. And some of the aspects of fruit development that we think are really important in increasing the yield even further is to be able to understand fertility and maturation and how tissue is synchronized in its growth between the seeds and the whole pots by the time that the fruit will open. We also think that shape and size is important. Of course, size you can imagine. If you have bigger fruits, you can put in more seeds. Of course, but also shape seems to be a very important issue for farmers and especially the harvesting uh, equipment that they're using. And then pot shatter that I've already talked about. I'm going to talk, tell you some work that we're now doing on shape uh, and size. And this is work where we are using this difference between Arabidopsis and its very close relative in the Brassicaceae family, Capsella. You can see these are, are very similar uh, uh, plants. They're about the same height, grow about the same same way, but they are fundamentally different in their fruit shape. And this project is being run by uh, Tilly Elwood, who's a, who a joint PhD student between myself and Enrico Cohn at the um, JIC. And also we have assistance from other people in the lab who are both de developing genetic resources in Capsella and also continuing the uh, other aspects of, of, the, um, of the project. But the question that Tilly is really interested in is how do, um, what are the genetic events that directs and makes the decision to direct anisotropic growth and lead to differences in fruit shape? So by a key component of this work is to really understand in very great detail the events that goes on during development. From this stage here, the floral meristems, so we can't really distinguish between Arabidopsis and Brassica to uh, throughout uh, the uh, development of the gynecium and the fruit to these mature stages here. And she does this by, by, on, by uh, measuring, so Tilly is carrying this out by measuring these different gynecia at all these different stages to find out where the differences take place. And this, is, this movie was made by, uh, by Tilly using uh, optical projection tomography. Um, but she also has used SEM images here to um, which is perhaps a bit easier to visualize here, uh, how the, the individual stages they, they in, of Arabidopsis compared to Capsella down here. So Arabidopsis grows pretty much like a, you know, a cylinder in, in length. It grows up a bit in width and, and uh, very much in length to create this uh, structure over here from this ball of cells over here. But this ball of cells is very similar in Capsella when they start out. But in Capsella, there are two phases. The first phase goes up to fertilization, where you have this disc forming over here. This is what we call phase one. In phase two, the disc then changes into the heart shape. It is these events that we are very interested in finding out what they are, uh, what happens. And Tilly first did an analysis using sector analysis lines, where she does a heat shock at a certain stage during gynecium development here. And these, uh, there will be certain cells that will then undergo a change from expressing YFP to uh, RFP, for instance, and by following at different time points during development, she can then see how this cell has divided in, in, in length or, for instance, in width. And what she found by doing this analysis is that Arabidopsis 
is that growth is polar, so you see they are mostly longitudinal uh, sectors here, and also uh, uh, parallel to, this, uh, to, to the polarity gradient from bottom to the top. But also it seems like there are small, some short sectors here and there at the base and, and at the top that suggest that growth is inhibited in these areas. Also there are some very narrow uh, sectors here which, which, she, uh, which Tilly interprets is where the replum is forming, you know, remember the, the, the central part of the fruit. So by using this information, she then went on to use something called a program uh, called the Growth Toolbox developed by uh, Andrew Bangham and Enrico Cohen. Andrew is from uh, the UEA. And here she uh, started out by having this kind of cylindrical shape where she has a polarizer that starts from the bottom and goes towards the top. And then she divides the tissue into replum, base, style, valves, and then puts some growth restrictions uh, in there. And then by this way, she was pretty uh, quickly in obtaining a shape that looks pretty much like a normal Arabidopsis shape. But when she then moved this into, uh, to try and make a heart shape, then that turned out to be much more difficult. To make a flat heart in starting out with a shape like this was not easy in this, using this growth toolbox. So she started to look a bit more about the parameters. And one thing she found was that if she put more restrictions than in Arabidopsis on the, uh, on the apex here, the top and the bottom, she was actually able to get something, uh, here comes a little movie, that uh, grew much more, at least to the gynesium stage that of uh, the end of uh, phase two that I showed you before, which is also shown right here. But if you look at this structure from the top, what you can see though is it's not by no means flat. It's completely round like a, like a balloon. So there has to be other parameters that, that needs to be uh, put in place in order to explain how uh, Capsella makes this disc form. And one could, for instance, be to put restrictions in the red pump region, uh, also in Capsella. And when Tilly did this, she got something that is at least a bit more flat than it was before, but still not completely. Um, but then she uh, did uh, various things, and she talked to a lot of people, and she decided to maybe uh, try and expand growth, specifically in the mid-valve. So you can imagine the red pump would be here in the middle, in the mid-valve. And that actually gave rise to so expanded growth here on the sides, and that gave rise to something that is very similar to what we actually observe. But of course, in order to verify that this is in, uh, indeed what, what happens in, in real, um, in, in, in the capsular fruit, she has to show this experimentally. And here she has now, now transferred this, these sector lines here, where you have the YFP, also CFP and RFP, that can then be induced by heat shock and uh, expressing this cre recombinase to go, for instance, this is an example from root, where you have the y, y, uh, YFP here, 37 degrees, then gives rise to these kind of sectors here. So Tilly has just managed to show this also now in the, in the, in the gynesium, but she hasn't been able to analyze the data before uh, I give this talk here. Thank you. Yeah, almost done also. So we have sort of come from through uh, phase one using the growth toolbox to get to this stage here, and we have reached a stage which Rico calls the Chinese snuff bottle stage. But the question is, of course, here, how do we then get to the next stage? How, does, how do the, uh, the hearts uh, actually form? And from this, we found in the literature a paper from 1914, so a 100-year-old paper this year by George Harrison Schul from Boston. He reports that a, a Capsella pastoris, which is a, a tetraploid Capsella, and he had identified this, he called Hegeria variant, which only produces cylindrical fruits. And when he did a, a back cross and analyzed the F2, he found out that they segregated 15 to 1, which is one of the classical genetic examples of a non-Mendelian, it was sort of at the time. And uh, Schul did indeed propose that there might be two genes then that are responsible for forming this uh, um, heart shape in, in uh, Capsella versus Pastoris. But that could, for instance, suggest that in what, what he found was that are there any mutants from Arabidopsis that we could, for instance, look to that would be uh, the ones that, that would be responsible for a phenotype like this in Capsella? And when we looked at some of the cross section that uh, uh, George Harrison Schultz's wife had uh, illustrated in the paper, what, he found, what we found was that there is actually a mutant in Arabidopsis that looks very much like this cross section that you see here. And that is a uh, mutation in the fruitful gene. And fruitful indeed also looks very much like. Uh, like uh, this uh, Capsella mutant here. So we went f to, uh, we, so we emailed George Harrison Schul, but have not received uh, any answers. 
So we decided then to set up uh, our own mutagenesis to recreate this uh, fruitful mutant in a diploid capsella, which is called capsella rubella here. And these are uh, Frederike and uh, Nicola and, and other people in the lab helped us to establish this uh, population. And we developed it into a tillable or tilling population and found then various alleles of capsella uh, fruitful mutations throughout the, the, uh, the, the um, fruitful gene in capsella. And when we looked at the phenotype of those, we could see that they are indeed very similar to the ones that were reported in Schultz's paper over here. These are papers that were, these were are also mutants that were found uh, independently by Michael Lenhardt, uh, by Michael Lenhardt's group in Germany, also verified to have uh, mutations in the fruitful gene. So we have recreated this uh, Higiri phenotype 100 years on. And when we look at them, and uh, uh, at the phenotype, you can see that, that the fruitful mutant compared to wild type does not seem to have any phenotype in the phase one growth stage. But it's clear that we may go on to look at the second stage. This is where the defect is. And this is where we think this tool can be very, very valuable for us in understanding how we get from the Chinese snuff bottle then on to the, um, uh, to the heart shape. And of course, we are now doing some experiments where we are shuffling the Eropsis fruitful into the capsella mutant and vice versa to see if we can then create heart-shaped Eropsis fruits and cylindrical capsella fruits and so forth. But we also have identified additional mutants in the population that we are preliminarily calling uh, heartless and heartbreak that uh, may also be additional components to the, uh, to the, to the uh, to, to, uh, uh, um, setting up the heart shape. And by this, I'd just like to finish with the key points of what I've talked to you about, that it's really, we've shown that it's very uh, highly possible to, to, to transfer knowledge from Arabidopsis to use in uh, um, addressing pot cheddar in all seed rape. We know that growth of, of capsular fruits and growth of some organs at least happens in distinct phases of development. And we definitely also know now that a, a fruitful gene is important for the phase two heart-shaped formation in a capsella. And this knowledge is what we are believing is we can take on to then also address shape issues and regulate shape in um, oil seed rape. And I just like to, to thank the people from the lab, especially Tilly Eldridge, who is sitting right there in the middle, who has done all the work on capsella, and also our collaborations with Rico and uh, Michael are very, very uh, uh, fruitful, I should say. And uh, here is our funding, and as well from, uh, crop, from the crop clock. Sorry I went a bit over. Thanks very much. Thank you.